Thank you, Jeff. My name is Diana Marino Vega, and I'm Director of Research Partnerships at Friends of Cancer Research. It's an honor to present the CT Monitor Project results on behalf of the CT Monitor Working Group. As you can see, the CT Monitor Project is a team effort, and I would like to acknowledge our numerous partners without whom this project would not be possible. I would like to especially recognize the work and talent of the Cancer Research and Biostatistics team led by Dr. Ansha Horing, especially Dr. Katie Nishimura, the senior biostatistician for this project, Vanessa Salento and Adam Rosenthal, as well as Matt Scott. Additionally, a special mention to Naveen Sarifa from the NMD group for her expertise. As Jeff and Julia previously mentioned, the CT Monitor project consists of two steps. Step one will set the foundation for future work. We were primarily interested in determining whether trends observed in independent data sets could be replicated in aggregate. To do this, we had to address several challenges, such as developing tools for streamlining the data intake processes, understanding the existing ctDNA data available, evaluating the feasibility of harmonizing ctDNA data generated by different sources and harmonize the clinical data, in analyzing the relationship between ctDNA values and tumor response. You will see in today's presentation that we have achieved our goal. We now ask ourselves, what are the research questions we should prioritize for step two? And what can we learn from step one to develop an informed framework for step two? This project has generated results very quickly, and this is largely due to the invaluable support of our partners. Not only do they commit data, but they also provided their time and expertise at every step of the journey. The statistical experts met several times a month and all partners met in January and May to finalize the statistical analysis plan and review the preliminary results respectively. Here you can see the steps we took and the pace at which we progressed. I will start by describing some of the challenges we faced with the disparate data sets we received and how we were able to find solutions for data harmonization. The CT Monitor Working Group decided on a set of criteria that would ensure success while balancing scientific robustness within a rapid time frame. The criteria used for the collection of data included immediately available data from patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer who were treated with an immune checkpoint inhibitor, and we required studies to have evaluated tumor response, collected survival data, and a minimum of two ctDNA measurements one at baseline, and one or more follow-up samples, assessed and reported as variance-level data in the form of variant allele frequency, or VAF. The chart on the right shows the sample size of the pooled data set used for the final analyses, which included data from five sponsors split into seven cohorts with a total of 200 patients. Data sets used in this analysis were originally designed to examine different research questions so they used different collection time points and had their own eligibility criteria. Therefore, we expected and observed many differences across data sets that could provide biased results when analyzing pooled data. There were five potential sources of bias that we highlight here. The retrospective nature of the data sets meant that we could not retrieve additional data elements or request a new sampling schedule for consistent data collection across all cohorts. We had to use the data we had. We discussed various solutions with our study partners to determine optimal approaches that would mitigate any downstream bias introduced by these features, while prioritizing inclusion to maximize the number of samples. This was done prior to performing any of our analyses. We believe that the approaches used to address each problem greatly reduce the noise and bias inherent to these data. On the next few slides, I will describe some of these solutions. Inconsistencies in the timing of ctDNA assay and tumor response evaluations across the data sets were apparent very early on, as this figure clearly shows. Every row represents a patient, and these are ordered by follow-up time. The pink dots represent the timing of the ctDNA sampling, and the blue dots represent the tumor response assessments. As you can see, the number of ctDNA samples per patient also deferred by sponsor. We used timing windows to ensure that samples that were overly dissimilar from the rest of the data were excluded. We also conducted a sensitivity analysis to determine the influence of ctDNA timing, but we didn't have the right type of data to draw any significant conclusions. 
Another challenge was the variability in the clinical detail provided and heterogeneity of patient populations in the study. We evaluated each baseline clinical trait, most of which we collapsed into binary and categorical variables here outlined in red. In the blue outline, you can see imbalances in the clinical covariates across cohorts, which provided rationale for the importance of stratifying the statistical models by cohort. The rows in bold are clinical traits that differ by cohort and were thus identified as potential prognostic factors in downstream analyses. As a result, we chose to include all clinical traits in our statistical analysis plan. I will point out that some of them, such as smoking and PDL1 expression, remain statistically significant in multivariate models, though those findings were inconsistent. Many different methods are currently being used to quantify changes in ctDNA. Thus, we developed and evaluated several approaches. Obtaining variant level data from each patient was key in our ability to explore different types of ctDNA metrics. Because of the data available, we used two ctDNA time points for all samples. Baseline ctDNA, which included plasma collected no more than 14 days prior to start of treatment, and time point one, or T1, a collection no later than 70 days from the start of treatment. The mean, median, and maximum VAF were calculated for each ctDNA sample, and then the percent change in the VAF values from baseline to T1 were calculated. The continuous percent change variable in the blue box was the percent change of ctDNA from baseline to T1. Mm -hmm. Patients with a negative percent change value had a decrease in ctDNA from baseline, and those with positive percent change an increase. The ctDNA metric proved to be the most difficult to analyze because of the presence of a large, a few large genuine outliers. Even after the outliers were capped at 500%, in general, this ctDNA metric was the weakest of the three. The two-level variable in the green box was defined after performing an optimal cut point analysis, which identified negative 50%, a 50% decrease in ctDNA, as an optimal cut point that maximized differences in overall survival. Patients were assigned to two groups, having a large decrease in ctDNA that exceeded 50% or having an increase or minor decrease in ctDNA. The three-level variable in the yellow box was created to investigate trends in ctDNA changes, as well as take into account cohort-specific differences in the ctDNA results. Within each cohort, patients were ordered based on their ctDNA percent change values. Among patients with decreases in ctDNA, the 50% with the most extreme decreases were assigned to a decrease category. Among patients with an increase or no change in ctDNA, the 50% with the most extreme increase were assigned to an increased category. All remaining patients were assigned to the intermediate category. All three of these types of ctDNA metrics were calculated for mean, median, and max VAF. However, for simplicity purposes, we will only show results for max VAF, which had the strongest and most consistent signal across multiple analyses. Four clinical outcomes were assessed in step one. Overall and progression-free survival were evaluated using Cox proportional hazards models and logistic regression models were used to evaluate partial response or better, or PFS, more than six months. In addition to the ctDNA metrics, we also evaluated common clinical descriptors, as well as baseline ctDNA values through univariate, bidirectional, and full multivariate models to adjust for confounding by key factors. All models were stratified by cohort to account for cohort-specific effects. Now we will move on to some of the highlights from the project results. We observed strong associations with overall survival here on the left and progression-free survival on the right for the three-level ctDNA metric. The strength of association across levels was quite pronounced with a clear gradient. Patients who had a strong decrease in max VAF, the dark blue curve, were associated with the best survival. Patients who had a strong increase in ctDNA, their red curve, having the worst survival, and patients in the intermediate category, the green curve, being somewhere in the, in the middle in between. All but one of the pairwise p-values comparing the individual curves were significant. 
Similarly, strong findings were seen in the two-level ctDNA metric where patients who had a strong decrease in ctDNA had better OS and PFS. Multivariate Cox models demonstrated that the three-level ctDNA metric remained strongly associated with OS, as shown in the figure on the left, and PFS, shown in the right, even after adjustment by other key clinical covariates. The orange box in the last row of these figures highlights the hazard ratio greater than one, which indicate increased risk of an event, in this case, 2.28 times the risk for death on the left and 1.76 times the risk for disease progression or death on the right, with each increasing level of the three-level ctDNA metric, so from strong decrease to intermediate to strong increase groups. Finally, we also observed that strong decrease in ctDNA is also associated with improved patient response, defined as partial response or better based on the two-level VAF percent change group. The downward sloping dashed lines for each cohort show that the predicted probability of achieving a partial response or better declines in patients who had an increase or weak decrease in ctDNA. Logistic regression analysis of the aggregate data set revealed an odds ratio less than one, in this case 0.12, demonstrating a strong reduction in the odds of achieving partial response or better in patients who had an increase or weak decrease in ctDNA. So, as you have seen, step one of this project achieved all of its milestones and produced some very promising results. Through careful and strategic harmonization strategies, we have shown that disparate ctDNA datasets can be aggregated and analyzed together. Decreases in ctDNA were found to be associated with better clinical outcomes in multiple analyses, including overall progression-free survival, durable clinical benefit, defined as progression-free survival at greater than six months, and tumor response, defined as partial response or better. Interestingly, we did not find evidence that baseline ctDNA values were predictive of clinical outcomes, implying that the change in ctDNA from baseline is a stronger indicator of response to treatment. Finally, these associations remained even after accounting for cohort-specific differences in other clinical covariates. We were able to advance our knowledge substantially from the retrospective data used in step one. As a proof of concept, these data gave us the opportunity to explore the, and experiment with different approaches. However, there were also limitations to the type of questions that we were able to answer with these data. If we had several ctDNA samples per patient collected at regular intervals, starting early during treatment, we would be able to investigate how early do changes in ctDNA predict patient outcome, a crucial question that would allow clinicians to make faster treatment decisions. Likewise, if we had more data from multiple tumor types, disease stages, drug classes, lines of therapies, and diagnostic assays, we would be able to determine whether the association reported in step one is consistent across all scenarios or only significant in some. Step two of the CT Monitor project provides stakeholders an unprecedented opportunity to further investigate key questions related to ctDNA and accelerate our understanding of the role of liquid biopsies in cancer research and care. So, we are asking for partners to join us for step two of the CT Monitor project, a rapid and ambitious timeline as we hope to read out sometime in 2022, will give us the advantage to drive some key conversations and propose data-driven solutions that will forge the path ahead in this innovative field. It is thanks to collaboration of this magnitude, which aggregates not only data from multiple partners, but also their vast expertise, that we will be able to expedite research and drive innovation in a way that translates to rapid patient impact. Thank you very much for your attention and interest in our work.